Hi, this is Brian Dolan from the law firm Pepper Hamilton. Today we're going to talk about fixed price contracts. Fixed price contracts are well known among contractors. These agreements seem simple. They do not allow the contract price to be modified after the award unless the parties expressly agree. But is it really that simple? In reality, there is very little case law guiding the practical approach to these types of contracts. Today we're speaking with Marion Hack, who advises clients on fixed price contracts and recently wrote about them for Associated General Contractors newsletter, AGC Law in Brief. Marion is a partner in Pepper's nationally recognized construction practice group, which Chambers USA recently named Construction Law Firm of the Year. The award capped an exceptional two years for the construction practice group for Pepper, during which the group added new depth to its bench and services and continued to deliver significant wins for clients in the most sophisticated construction matters in the world. Marion is also recognized by Chambers USA as a leading construction lawyer. She joins us today from our LA office to talk about the definition of fixed price contracts and cases in which the audit provision in the contract has been unsuccessfully used to assert claims for reimbursement and false claims act liability. Marion, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Can you tell our listeners what fixed price contracts are, including how and when they are used? Fixed price contracting is the most commonly used contract method in the United States. Basically, it is when an owner and a contractor or a contractor and a subcontractor agree upon a fixed price to do a particular scope of work. Fixed price contracting differs from the other types of contracting commonly used as cost type contracting. In cost type methods of contracting, the cost of the work is what dictates what is to be paid. For example, in a cost plus contract, the cost to do the work is added to a particular factor that includes overhead and markup, let's say 10%, and that is what the price of the contract is going to be. Also, there's such a thing as unit price contracting, where the unit price is agreed upon, and then it's determined at a later date how many units are used. In a fixed price method, the owner and the contractor agree to a fixed price to do the work. Now, what this does, on a practical standpoint, is it shifts the risk of contracting from the owner to the contractor, because the owner has agreed to a certain scope of work at a fixed price. Thus, the contractor has to complete that scope of work and is only entitled to that fixed amount. So, for example, if the contractor does that scope of work and it costs him more than the fixed price, then he's not entitled to more than the fixed price. He's entitled only to the amount he agreed upon in the fixed price contract. Conversely, if he can figure out a way to do it differently and save some money, he is the one that gets the savings in those contracts. They are commonly used in federal and state projects, and they're probably the most commonly used types of contracts in the United States. Okay, so what issues should contractors be aware of when they're entering into fixed price contracts? Well, obviously the first thing you have to be aware of is your scope of work. Is the scope of work defined adequately to include everything that you're supposed to do within that fixed price so that there's no arguments at a later date that the scope that you're doing is not within the fixed price of the contract? This is where I think most of the disputes resolve around fixed price contracting, where there's a there's a inadequate detailing of the scope of work within the contract. One of the issues that you do have to watch out for is an audit provision, and this is one of the issues that have been raised recently in some court cases. Many contracts have audit provisions in their contract where the owner can come in and audit the cost, the work, the uh, amount paid to your vendors, all of your business records, and there are some audit provisions that put in specific language that make it unclear whether or not they're entitled, if they find, like, for example, you've charged less for items in a fixed price context, that they may be entitled to a refund. Now, those have not necessarily been successful, but understand when you agree to an audit provision, there really should not be an audit provision in a fixed price context, except for, for example, regulatory matters, whether you're paying prevailing wage, you're paying your insurance, and things like that. But to audit a, the financials on a fixed price contract is really inappropriate because you've already agreed upon the price. So the cost to do the work really isn't relevant 
to the agreement between the parties. Now I have a two-part question for you next. How are public entities trying to circumvent fixed price terms in contracts, and then how are the courts responding? Well, this is where the audit provisions have come in. Some public entities have tried to use the audit provisions to audit fixed price agreements in order to recover some of the savings that the contractor was able to do under those contracts. There's a couple cases out there in which uh, the government has tried to come in, audit the contract, has actually been shown that the costs were not as great as the fixed price. But the courts have usually disallowed audits that try to basically destroy the agreement of the fixed price contract between the parties. The courts have recognized that the adequacy of the contract price is something that the government or the owner, because usually these are in federal government contracts, is supposed to determine up front. And also the owner takes the risk of paying too much, of not adequately figuring out whether this is the correct price for the contract. But the bottom line, the fixed price contract provides for a price that's not subject to any adjustment on the base of the contractor's cost experience in performing the contract. So since the contract places upon the contractor the maximum risk and the full responsibility for all costs, and resulting profit or loss, the courts are not going to change that risk profile. In other words, the owner would not have to pay more, for example, if the contractor spent more on the contractor, but conversely, they don't get the savings either. But again, the audit provisions are being used to claw back money when the audits demonstrate the contractor performed the work well under the fixed price amount. And in fact, one of the cases is Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield versus the United States. This is a court of claims case. In this case, the U.S. Claims Court held that a government contractor, Empire, was not liable to reimburse the government for increasing profits through the use of lower cost labor. In this instance, the contractor used a fixed price contract with the government to serve as a Medicare intermediary for New York State. During the negotiations, the government requested the contractor to provide a certificate of current cost or pricing data to support its proposed contract price, which it did provide. But during the term, there were several amendments to the scope of work and there was a bunch of different price assessments. And a later audit revealed that the labor cost actually decreased because it was able to re- reduce its staffing levels during the contract. Even though that the contractor was accomplished the work with fewer personnel that they initially sought, that was to their benefit, not to the government's benefits. So these savings and these estimated costs realized by the contractor during the performance of the base contract work gave the government no reprieve from the obligations to pay for that work. So in this case, the court, I believe, correctly held that the risk that the contractor took to perform the work at that fixed price, if they were able to realize the savings, they were also entitled to have those savings. In other words, the government couldn't have it both ways. The government can't say, well, if you if it costs more to do a fixed price contract, therefore you have to take that risk, but if it costs less, we get the savings. And that's not how fixed price contracting works. You mentioned in your answer profits and loss. What advice would you have for contractors to protect their profits in these situations? Well, it goes back to the audit provision because you have to be very careful in these contracts that there is not a provision, and it could even not be in the audit provision, that there's not a provision that allows the government to go back and reprice the contract based on the cost that the contractor experienced during the project. And these can be very simply put in the audit provisions, where the auditor, if the, and, they, and that's why they can be a little sneaky. So many people don't pay attention to these audit provisions, but the audit provision could say something along the lines of, the government has a right to audit the contract, and if the government discovers any overpricing or overcharges or costs incurred were higher than initially realized, then the contract can be adjusted. Now, 
some of those provisions I have seen have been incredibly broad, and we usually in the contract phase strike those provisions because it's really not a fixed price contract if you're allowed to audit and come and base it on cost. Because remember, there's two different types of contracting. There's fixed price contracting and there's contracting based on a cost performance. So you want to make sure that that contract does not get transferred after performance or during performance to something that is a cost-based contract if the government discovers you are actually performing these contracts at a profit. This is a great topic for us. Thank you very much for spending some time with our listeners today. You're welcome. For our listeners, be sure to check out the Insight Center at PepperLaw.com for more podcasts and articles from our construction practice group, as well as the practice group's blog, which can be found at ConstructLaw.com. Thanks for listening.